Hi everybody, how you doing? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Here we go again. Uh, this is Pharmacology Point Two. Uh, Mike Biamonte, uh, manager for FBI School of Operational Medicine. Hope everybody had a great weekend. If you celebrated Easter, I hope you enjoyed Easter. A little odd, not being able to get together with everybody because of COVID. Uh, I hope everybody is COVID free. Still, unbelievable uh, response to the videos. Thank you so much. I think we have close to 2,000 views now, which is unbelievable. I don't just blows my mind, quite frankly. Uh, a couple of things that I've noticed, some of the feedback we're getting is just great about different topics people want to hear about and see. And we'll try to get to all those. Um, my black polo shirts and my logos of all the things in the world. Uh, I never thought I would ever have comments on what I wear. Houston is being represented today. I may have to start going to t-shirts after a while. I got a ton of t-shirts with different crap on it. You know, polos, not too many, but i Guess people are commenting on it. I don't know why, but hey, whatever it takes. <clears throat> uh, let's see, this morning, my beverage of choice is coffee. Okay, it's coffee this morning. So let's go ahead and get started. No, um, nothing classified, nothing sensitive, no endorsements. You're going to see me putting a lot of pictures up today on different um, types of medications. Uh, brand name, trade name, that kind of thing. Uh, generic names. I could care less what you buy. All right, I'm not endorsing anything. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's talk about drugs. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit drinking. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit amphetamines. Picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. I love that clip. Love that movie. Uh, for those of you who uh, have been around long enough, that's just fantastic. If you've never seen that movie, there's something wrong with you, quite frankly. That's just my opinion, of course. We're going to focus a lot on the medications that BLS providers can assist in or give, depending on your protocol. Um, but we're going to also dive a little bit into the ALS world as we go through these. This is knocking over the tip of the iceberg again. There's so many uh, meds out there, and depending on what organization you work for, your drug box may be full of just, just dozens of different medications. Then you get into the critical care world, and that medication box just explodes. But we're going to keep it pretty simple. We're not going to get too crazy on meds. So let's go over um, one of the first ones, and we're not going alphabetical here. This is just uh, as per my textbook and how it kind of flows. Um, let's talk about aspirin first. All right, aspirin. We're not talking about aspirin for a headache. I had asked a class one time, a paramedic class uh, uh, question. I said, all right, why do you give aspirin uh, to somebody in a pre-hospital, or why do you give aspirin to somebody who's, who's having a cardiac event and uh, the answer they gave me was uh, because the nitroglycerin gives them a headache. Okay, they weren't wrong, but no, that's not the right answer. Uh, 81 milligram baby aspirin. I always thought it was sort of weird that you would call aspirin baby aspirin. Because one of the contraindications in uh, administration of aspirin is pediatrics. You don't give kids aspirin. You don't want to give them Rye syndrome as a possible complication. So I always thought it was sort of odd that you called it baby aspirin. But... We talked a little bit about baby aspirin last class or last video and why we give it um, aspirin in the chewable form, 81 milligram chewable aspirin in the acute coronary syndrome is paramount as per the latest and greatest science in plating or coating those platelets so that clots don't continue to build. Just to be clear, aspirin does not break up a clot, but it'll prevent a clot from getting any larger. And all you're really doing is buying your patient some time to get into the cath lab, you know, get into the ER, essentially. You want to give the chewable type because it's going to absorb faster. Uh, your protocol may call for one, two, three, or four baby aspirin. It just depends. Uh, but again, you'd like it to be <clears throat> the low dose 81 milligram chewable type. Uh, you can assist with that on the BLS level. Now, uh, another picture we're going to show here is Tylenol. Tylenol and aspirin are two different animals, two totally different things. One doesn't work like the other. Um, aspirin can be a bit uh, GI caustic, 
right? So basically, if you're going to you're about to give aspirin to a patient, and you go through your sample history, which we'll discuss in a different video, and you find out that they are allergic, quote unquote, to aspirin, ask your patient what happens if they take it. They may turn around and say, "Oh well, uh, my my ulcer gets upset." Okay, here's your aspirin. Now, if they outright refuse it, you can't force it on them. But uh, here's your aspirin. We'll deal with your GI issue later. Let's take care of your heart. Uh, Tylenol is different. It's a bit hepatotoxic. It's a bit more toxic to your liver. So those of you who like to whoop it up on the weekends and you have a hangover and you have a headache, uh, I just stay away from the Tylenol for your headache because that's just going to beat up your, your liver all that much more. Uh, it is an antipyretic, which means it's going to reduce your fever. Uh, but it also has some analgesic properties, uh, analgesic being painkilling. Um, in the tactical environment, if you have operators that you know are going to be going out on a mission, going out on a high-risk warrant, whatever, uh, if there's a high potential for them to suffer penetrating trauma, blast injuries, blunt force trauma, whatever, and you have operators that are taking Motrin or aspirin, because we're all getting older, none of us, well, I shouldn't say none of us, a lot of us aren't the 20-year-old warfighter anymore. You may want to advise some of those operators to wean off of the Motrin, which we'll talk about here in a second, or aspirin, because it's going to affect their ability to clot. Uh, in some situations, this is why in pill packs and other types of uh, packaging, we'll go to Tylenol uh, or Mobic or something like that, uh, just to prevent that um, uh, anticoagulant problem. So if somebody's getting somebody gets shot or blown up, we want to let the body fight and clot as as most effectively as it can. So that's Tylenol. Let's go to another one. Corman's candy. Uh, we carried this around as Corman in our pockets, like it was, like they were chiclets. Um, as far as a Corman was concerned, Motrin can cure anything. Uh, you chop your hand off, here's some Motrin, you'll be fine. Uh, you're about to have a baby, here's some Motrin, you'll be fine. Comes 200, usually 200 milligram tablets over the counter. Uh, Corman typically carry the bigger horse pills, the 800 milligram. Works very well, uh, does its job. Just remember, it's also very GI caustic uh, or, or, or GI irritant. So you want to make sure people are taking this with food. Uh, all right. As we saw in that picture, uh, Motrin is also considered to be an NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So when you see those letters NSAID uh, put together, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, that's all it means. Let's look at glucose paste. We, we talked about glucose paste last video and the route of administration, 15 grams in the buccal route. That's going to be the most effective way to administer this medication. You don't want to have them swallow it. It just doesn't work as well, if really at all. So you want to squeeze that paste in between the cheek and gum. That's going to be where it's going to have the most bang for the buck. Um, so we had a picture of it here last time. Here's your glucose paste, 15 grams, pretty standard. Comes in lemon flavor, cherry flavor. They're all equally nasty. If you can't afford or your system, your organization just doesn't have the money for glucose paste, but it's in your protocol, go get cake icing in a tube and use that. It's going to do the same thing, and quite frankly, it tastes better. Uh, you have less of a chance of your patient spitting it back out at you. Uh, trust me, I know. Glucagon, another picture we're going to put up here. This is more for our ALS folk. So if we have a hypoglycemic patient, and we'll talk about endocrine emergencies and medical emergencies in later videos, but if we have somebody who's uh, hypoglycemic, unconscious, unresponsive, totally gorked, and those of us in the ALS world and BLS world uh, have seen countless numbers of these patients. Very easy to manage. Their sugar is very low. We have to give them sugar. They're unconscious and responsive, so we can't give them anything by mouth because we don't want to risk aspiration. If we can't get an IV in this patient or an IO, I wouldn't necessarily go IO, but if we can't get an IV in this patient and give them D10, D50, D25, whatever your protocol is, uh, we have to go a different route. Glucagon is a naturally occurring hormone secreted by your pancreas. Uh, the islets of Langerhan, uh, your alpha cells produce glucagon. What glucagon is, it is a hormone released from your pancreas, like I said, that goes to the major muscle groups of your body and releases glycogen. Glycogen is just stored sugar. So when you have your breakfast, lunch, dinner, 
you eat whatever you eat, your body is going to use what it wants and it's going to store the rest of it in your major muscle groups. This storage of sugar is stored in the form of glycogen. So, um, glucagon comes along when our blood sugar starts to drop, goes to these storage areas of the liver, our major muscle groups, and converts glycogen to glucose. And that's what it does. We have it in, a, in this form that you see here in front of you as an injectable for IM injection. Uh, because we can't get an IV, so we give it IM. It takes about 10 minutes for it to kick in. So in a lot of your hypoglycemic patients, what I'll end up doing is if I cannot find a vein, and a lot of your bad diabetics have very poor circulation, so it's hard to find a vein, I'll go ahead and I'll blast them with a milligram of glucagon IM and continue to look for an IV and let that glucagon start doing its thing. So that's just food for thought. You can also give glucagon for beta blocker overdoses, calcium channel blocker overdoses. Uh, as we discussed in the last video, when we talk about alpha beta, sympathetic nervous system, if somebody is has taken an overdose of beta blocker and we're trying to get their heart rate up because they're now so profoundly bradycardic, a lot of the medications we're going to give aren't going to work very well because of the amount of the beta blocker on board blocking all the beta 1 receptor sites. We can come along and give glucagon. Glucagon works on a different receptor site, the myocardial level and will actually have what's called a positive chronotropic effect, and we'll talk about that later. But it'll have a, a positive effect on the heart to bring the heart rate up just by a different route of, of, a, of attacking the heart. But glucagon, in most protocols for that, you're given higher doses, about 3 milligrams, but it has to be IV, not IM. So, just something to think about. Uh, next slide is EpiPen. We talked about our EpiPen last uh, video. Anaphylactic reactions, uh, we already kind of went down this road, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. Let's see. All right, let me go ahead and pull the EpiPen down. Okay, refer to my notes. Make sure we're staying on track. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, we mentioned albuterol in the last video. Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist with mild beta-1 agonistic properties. So it's going to bronchodilate, and it's also going to increase the heart rate a little bit uh, because it's just going to ping some of your beta-1 receptor sites while it pings beta-2. It's considered to be somewhat non-selective, but it does really focus on beta-2. So you're going to have bronchodilation. You're going to help your patient breathe better. Simple enough. Well, like any other drug... Patients can build up a tolerance or a resistance to a drug if they take it year after year after year. It just depends on the patient. So let me go ahead and put albuterol up here. There's albuterol. Albuterol, uh, Prevental, all right, generic name versus trade name. Uh, great drug. Works very, very well. This is what you're going to see a lot of times out in the field, your beta-2 stimulant drugs. Typically, 2.5 milligrams, uh, you can give it any number of different ways, all the way from a syrup in the pediatric environment uh, to being nebulized. So this next drug here, Atrovent, uh, Ipetrop, I, something or other, I can't remember the name of the generic, Ipetropium, I believe it is. Isn't that terrible? I should have had that prepared, but I think that's it. Usually it's about 0.5 milligrams. Um, Still same thing, nebulized, you can take it. But the nice thing about Atrovent versus, at, uh, versus uh, Albuterol is it works differently in the body. And it tricks the body to bronchodilate. So if your body is used to nothing but Albuterol, 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 Beta-2, 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 your body can build up a resistance. And this is what happens to a lot of very bad asthmatics. We come along, sometimes we'll give a combi vent. We'll give albuterol and atrovent at the same time, or we'll just give straight up atrovent. It just depends on the system. How atrovent works, it is a muscarinic antagonist. Okay, let's go back to the last video. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic receptor sites, alpha, beta. Parasympathetic receptor sites, muscarinic, nicotinic. Muscarinic slows you down, nicotinic speeds you up in certain areas. So the muscarinic receptor sites in your bronchioles are going to prevent, if stimulated, are going to prevent bronchodilation. So if we come along and give a muscarinic antagonist, which is Atrovent, 
It's going to block those muscarinic receptor sites in the bronchioles, allowing the bronchioles to now dilate. So we're achieving the same goal as we would with albuterol, but just a different way. We're tricking the body to bronchodilate. So I think that's pretty, uh, pretty cool, actually. Uh, it's an anticholinergic drug, another way of saying it. So those are your more common respiratory, emergency respiratory meds. I'm not going to get into steroidals or anything like that or racemic epinephrine. We'll talk about that another time. All right, let's move on to nitroglycerin. We talked about nitroglycerin basically in the last video. It is a very potent vasodilator. That's what it does. Um, given for your acute coronary syndrome patients, and we'll talk more about them in another video. But with acute coronary syndrome, we have lactic acid production at the myocardial level because of a lack of blood flow, because of the lack of uh, coronary artery perfusion or reduced diameter of coronary arteries. So the biggest misconception about nitroglycerin is, oh, it's a very potent coronary artery dilator. Therefore, it's going to allow more blood to pass by, getting rid of that anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid, yada, yada, yada. Well, that's true to a certain degree. Uh, it will coronary artery dilate, but how it really has its biggest effect is in the reduction of the workload of the heart by reducing preload. Mm. Now we're going back to that patho video. Remember, there's a method to my madness. So preload, leading contributing factor to stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount, well, let's go back to the definition of preload. Preload and diastolic volume. So at the end of diastole, what is the volume of blood in your ventricles available for ejection during contraction or systole? Stroke volume is how much blood is ejected from the ventricles with one contraction. So the more blood you bring into the heart, the higher the workload or demand of your heart is. So if we reduce the preload, we reduce the end diastolic volume. By reducing end diastolic volume, we're reducing stroke volume, we're reducing the workload of the heart, thereby reducing the oxygen demand of the myocardial tissue, thereby helping the body or the heart reduce its lactic acid production because of anaerobic metabolism, so on and so on and so on. So nitroglycerin is really good for that. A lot of systems are getting away from nitro uh, just because of various reasons, nuclear scans in the ER, it affects the test results and a couple of different things. Uh, nitro is still out there. Be careful with your patients taking ED medications, erectile dysfunction medications, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, any one of these. Uh, your Cialis and your Levitra have about a 72-hour window where you don't want to give Nitro and those drugs together, where your Viagra is still about a 24-hour window. Um, women can take these drugs too for a variety of different reasons. It's uh, not given just for ED. So really go through a good sample before you give somebody nitroglycerin. And we'll talk more heavily about nitro when we get into the cardiac world. Uh, let me go ahead and pull this down, make sure we're on the right track here. And let's start talking about, oh, there goes my, we're good. Don't panic, we're all right. Let's talk now about some of the good stuff. Again, most of you have seen that movie. That's the good stuff, all right? Illegal, but good. Uh, so I've read. Let's talk about fentanyl. Now, let's dispel with some rumors about fentanyl, all right? In the opioid world, opioids uh, being a uh, chemically synthesized opium from your poppy plants. Uh, if you eat a poppy seed bagel, no, you're not going to pop positive on a pee test. You need to eat like pounds of poppy seeds to pop positive. So if you're going for a job interview and you pop positive for opioids and your excuse is that you had a poppy seed bagel that morning, <laughs> no, probably not so much. So take that uh, into consideration. Um, but your opioids are fantastic drugs for analgesia, analgesia being pain control. And we'll talk about uh, analgesia versus um, uh, sedative versus paralytic. We'll touch on that here in a second. But let's use average everyday street heroin 
to morphine, to fentanyl, to carfentanyl, to all very powerful drugs. Now, we'll just use morphine as an example. Morphine isn't really used all that much pre-hospitally anymore. It's still out there, don't get me wrong. It's just not quite as popular because fentanyl has come out. And I was most careful how I say this. I've been using fentanyl in the pre-hospital environment for years now. It's a fantastic drug for analgesia. Part of the reason it's such a fantastic drug for analgesia is it doesn't have the hemodynamic effect that morphine has. Uh, morphine can create some big vasodilation. And part of the reason it has this vasodilation is only because, not to say only, but that's uh, just part of its natural side effect is it's going to vasodilate. But it can also trigger a histamine release. And we're going to talk about histamines here in a little bit. But if we have a tremendous histamine release in response to morphine being pushed into your system, well, now that creates a potentiating effect of more vasodilation and leaky capillary syndrome. So in a lot of cases, if we've given somebody morphine and their pressure really starts to tank, I don't jump right to the Narcan. We'll talk about Narcan here in a minute too. Um, I'll open up their fluids, you know, try and bowl some with some fluids, fill the container, but I'll also give them some Benadryl. Benadryl is an antihistamine. It'll block that histamine response and also bring their pressure or stabilize their pressure, but maintain that analgesic effect. Right, so just something to think about. Any opioid, you want to be concerned with respiratory depression. And we'll talk about Narcan here in a second because it does ping those respiratory centers of the brain. But the fear with fentanyl that's out there is overblown. Uh, if you walk up to fentanyl that you see on a table, I don't know where you would be unless you're in law enforcement or you walk into a, a drug den, if it happens to get on your skin, you happen to touch it with closed skin, it's not broken, uh, you're not going to keel over and die right away. It doesn't work like that. Unless it's chemically made to go transdermally, and they do have transdermal fentanyl or fentanyl patches, um, you're not going to keel over and die. If you get a big nose full of it and you walk into a room, might you get a little high? Yeah, you might. Uh, my advice to you, leave the room, go outside, sit on the curb. You bought the ticket, enjoy the ride. Right? Does that patient need Narcan? Do you need Narcan? No. Only people who need Narcan are the people who are unconscious, unresponsive, uh, bradypnic, snoring on their tongue, pinpoint pupils, that, that perfect package. So uh, unless you have a gross exposure, like we just saw with Al Pacino, and that was cocaine, not heroin, but you get the, the idea, or fentanyl, you get the idea. Don't worry about being exposed to these drugs. Uh, just common sense. If, if it doesn't belong to you, don't touch it. Um, if you see it floating around in the air, leave the room. Uh, <laughs> basic stuff. Okay, let me get off fentanyl. That's my uh, my soapbox for fentanyl. So we're talking about analgesia is painkilling. Sedation is putting somebody in la la land, and paralysis is paralysis. You're paralyzing somebody. So if I give somebody a drug that's a neuromuscular blocker, uh, so let's go ahead and just put a picture up here for a second. Okay, here's fentanyl. This is your painkiller. Uh, this is analgesia. Um, we're going to talk about Versed here in a second. Uh, that's a, a benzodiazepine. That is a sedative. It's going to put you in la-la land. And the category of drug we're not going to talk about in this video is your neuromuscular blocking drugs, your succinylcholine or nectine, your uh, rocuronium, your vecuronium, these paralytic drugs that we give to put somebody down and intubate them. If I give somebody succinylcholine and paralyze them and they're a trauma victim and I intubate them, well, that drug, a neuromuscular blocker being succinylcholine or any neuromuscular blocker, does nothing to affect somebody's cognitive ability. So let me pull a slide down. So if I give somebody succinylcholine, they're still with it. They know what's going on. They can see, smell, hear, feel everything you're doing. That's kind of creepy. But they're lying there paralyzed. And they know they're paralyzed. And they know they can't breathe. But again, they can see, smell, hear, and feel everything you're doing. There have been documented cases of, anal um, of uh, anesthesiologists Withholding sedation versus 
withholding pain medications, fentanyl as an example, and keeping it for themselves or selling it outright and giving the patient just a neuromuscular blocker. So here's a patient on the OR, OR slab having surgery performed and they can feel everything and they know what's going on, which is pretty wild and pretty scary, quite frankly. So just because somebody has received a paralytic, they still have it all up here cognitively, so you've got to sedate them. Even if you've sedated them and paralyzed them, they may still be able to feel pain. Sedation doesn't equate to pain control. So you may still have to give them some sort of analgesic. So just keep these things in mind as an ALS provider. Keep these things in mind. So let me just talk about Narcan for a second here. Let me put this up on the screen. Last video, we talked about routes of administration. One route that I neglected to mention, a very important route, is the intranasal route, IN. So you see the little cone on the tip of that uh, Brista jet there? That's designed to go up into your nose, or the patient's nose, and push half that drug in each nostril, or depending on what your protocol is, that'll aerosolize that medication and it'll coat that oral, or that nasal mucosa and absorb very quickly. Um, it's a fantastic route of administration, especially at the BLS level where you don't want to mess around with needles. Uh, so if you have somebody who's a victim of an overdose, opioid overdose, and you don't want to mess around with needles with these people and you just jam this in their nose, it's going to work. It'll take a couple of minutes, but it, it is going to work. Um, fentanyl can be given this way, uh, Narcan can be given this way, uh, certain um, inoculations at the pediatric level can be given this way. So it really is a very, very popular route of administration. That's the intranasal route. Um, contrary to popular belief, Narcan does not work on alcohol, does not work on cocaine, does not work on benzos. Uh, the only thing that works on a benzo is a drug called flamazenil or mazicon, and that's typically not a pre-hospital drug. So Narcan is a fantastic drug for opioids, and only opioids. I cannot tell you how many patients I've woken up with Narcan, and they look at me and say, oh, no, no, I wasn't taking any kind of opioids. Pal, I woke you up with Narcan. The only thing it works on is opioids. You're a junkie. Own it, be comfortable with it, let's move on. So those are typically the games you play. So let me pull this down. Okay, so depending on whether you're a fire EMS, um, law enforcement, uh, FBI, for the FBI, we have Narcan in some of our teams. Uh, uh, law enforcement, you'll find it in just about, I shouldn't say it, just about every patrol car. I don't know that for a fact, but you'll find it in some uh, patrol officers. They'll be carrying it. Uh, but obviously in the EMS community, every paramedic carries this. It's, it's, a, it's a staple, quite frankly. So let's look now at a different category of drug, your benzodiazepine. So we talked about fentanyl or morphine. These are more your painkillers, your analgesia. We talked about the antidote or the analgesic, I'm sorry, uh, the antagonistic drug for opioid is Narcan. Now we'll talk about benzos or sedatives. And this is one category of a sedative. There are dozens out there. This is just your more common type that you'll see. So let me put this picture up. This is midazolam or Versed. Uh, very good drug. Uh, I've been using, again, in the pre-hospital setting, using this for years. The nice thing about Versed uh, or midazolam is its amnesic effect. So if I have to perform a procedure on someone, whether it be uh, rapid sequence intubation where I paralyze you, or I have to synchronize cardiovert you or pace you in the cardiac world, these are painful procedures. Uh, I'll give you this drug before I do it. You won't remember a damn thing that I've done to you, which is really, really beneficial to the patient's overall mental health afterwards. Because they don't have to suffer through something. They don't remember a thing. It's... Uh, X amount of time, minutes of their life that, <laughs> that just never get back. It just it doesn't exist in their mind, which is pretty cool. Uh, other types uh, of benzos, your Valium or Diazepam, which is still widely used pre-hospitally. Um, not so widely used, Ativan or Lorazepam, Xanax or Alprazolam. Usually your LAM drugs, your PAM drugs. These are your benzos uh, as a general rule. 
and they fall into the category of sedative hypnotic. So it's very much dose based. So if you give somebody X amount of this medication, you may just sedate them. Whereas if you give them a higher dose, it may go into a hypnotic state. Uh, so it depends on the drug. Let's see, let's see, let's see. What um, midazolam or Valium is really also very good for are, is what is called coronary, I'm sorry, cocaine-induced coronary artery spasm. So let me pull this slide down. Okay. In your cocaine uh, population, or people who are big into coke, so Al Pacino in that movie, um, what they can suffer from is a very, very strong sympathetic response to that coke or a very strong alpha response to that coke. Blood pressure shoots up, they'll blow blood vessels in their brain. I can't tell you how many uh, on the EMS side of the house responding, how many parties I've been to where you see somebody laying out on the floor from a huge inner cerebral bleed and everybody around them is all panicked and freaked out and they were doing huge amounts of coke during this party. Their blood pressure shot through the roof and they blew a blood vessel in their brain. Now they're completely stroked out. Happens all the time, unfortunately. Um, but what can also happen is they can suffer from what's known as cocaine-induced coronary artery spasm. So they won't have a clot in their coronary artery, but the coronary artery will actually spasm. And now you can't get any blood past it. And these patients are having huge MIs and maybe subsequently heart attacks and um, huge MIs and subsequently cardiac arrest. So if we have somebody who's having chest pain and they've been doing a lot of coke and they admit to it, which they don't always do, uh, nitro may not be the best answer. We may end up giving them some, uh, some benzo, some Valium, some Versed to stop that coronary artery spasming. Uh, of course, obviously, your benzos are going to be great for your seizure patients as well to stop them from seizing. So different categories that you can give. Let's see, we talked about Narcan. I want to refer to my notes here, make sure we're on track. We talked about that, we talked about that. All right, let's talk about um, atropine again. Uh, we mentioned atropine in the uh, last video, and we talked about its effect being a cholinergic blocking agent. So, in the case of bradycardia, where we have heavy parasympathetic stimulation, the commode code we talked about. We come along and give atropine. Atropine is going to bind to those muscarinic receptor sites, allowing sympathetic to take over, bringing somebody's heart rate up. A couple of points about atropine, depending on what your protocol is. Your dose is anywhere from about 0.5 milligrams to 1 milligram at a time. Your typical max dose is about 2 to 3 milligrams. That's AHA, average protocol USA. The trick about atropine is you cannot give less than 0.5 milligrams to an adult, and it always has to be pushed rapidly. Um, atropine is a, a plant derivative drug, the belladonna plant, and years ago, long time ago, they used to give this plant extract uh, to prisoners or whomever to kill them. What they would do is they would give it at a very low dose, at a very slow push, and it would have a paradoxical effect. It would have the opposite effect that we want. And it would slow their heart rate down so profoundly that it would kill them. Uh, what they found through trial and error is that if they gave a little bit more of it and they pushed it faster, it would bring their heart rate up. So with atropine, you always want to give more than 0.5 milligrams to an adult. You always want to push it rapidly. That's atropine in a nutshell. Let's see, uh, we talked about that, we talked about that. Let's talk about epinephrine. And this is a different type of epinephrine. This is the epinephrine we would give in a cardiac world. Uh, this is epinephrine one to 1,000. There's epinephrine one to 1,000, there's epinephrine one to 10,000. In a cardiac world, nine times out of 10, at the parapatic level for cardiac arrest, we give epinephrine one to 10,000. It's a ratio. So the best way it was ever described to me is if you had a room full of 10,000 ping, white ping pong balls and you dropped one red ping pong ball into that room, well, that's your solution. That's your concentration. The red ping pong ball is the epinephrine amongst 10,000 white ping pong balls. That's probably just sterile water. Uh, so that's the concentration. 
versus 1 to 1,000, which is going to be a lot stronger. You have a room full of 1,000 ping pong balls, and you have one red one in the mix. Well, that's your epinephrine, much stronger. We typically give epi 1 to 1,000 for anaphylactic patients in the acute setting, and I went to 10,000 more for cardiac patients, but we'll get into that in a later video. But this is typically how it comes packaged. So let's pull this down for a second. And let's talk about another drug we can give in the cardiac world. It doesn't have to be cardiac, uh, being the advanced world. This is not a BLS drug, uh, dopamine. Uh, dopamine is a misunderstood drug. It's a fantastic drug for bringing somebody's blood pressure up. It comes in a range of about 1 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, they talk about urinal dosing of 1 to 5 mics, and then a cardiac dosing, and a presser dosing, and a... Okay. Talk to many people, and they tell me that that renal reperfusing dose of 1 to 5 micros, uh, micrograms per kilogram per minute is garbage. It doesn't work. But that's more of a critical care thing in a pre-hospital world. We're not really going to be worrying about that. We danced in the 5 to 15 mic concentration in the 15 to 20 mic concentration. That's when we're going to get what's called a positive inotropic and chronotropic effect. Let's talk about those terms for a second. In pharmaceuticals and pharmacology and in the cardiac world, we talk about the effect the drug has on the body. A, a drug could have what's called a positive chronotropic, positive inotropic, and positive dromotropic effect. So let me pull this down for a second. So with those three different terms, positive chronotropic effect means it's going to um, increase your heart rate. Positive inotropic effect means it's going to increase the contractility of the heart. Whereas a positive dromotropic effect means it's going to have an increased conductivity in the heart. Some drugs do all three. Epinephrine is a positive inotrope, chronotrope, and dromotrope. Dopamine will do the same thing. Dopamine, quite frankly, all it does is it tells the body to secrete more epinephrine from the adrenal gland. It's really all dopamine does. So it's almost like giving them epinephrine. But the nice thing about dopamine in a drip form, because it is not in a bolus, you do not bolus dopamine. So let me go ahead and get on my soapbox about this one for a second. If you see providers out there, and I'm talking to you, providers that do this, you see providers out there that take dopamine, put it into the bag, pressure infuse that bag, and squeeze it in until the blood pressure comes up, and then they slow it down. That is wrong. If you're doing that, you're wrong, okay? Because <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to create such massive renal vasoconstriction that you're going to shut the kidneys down. Yeah, you may have brought the blood pressure up. Good for you. Congratulations. But now, if this patient survives, they'll be on renal, they'll be on dialysis for the rest of their lives. You didn't do them any good. Dopamine is a slow infusion. Dopamine is not a rapid infusion. It's not a bolus. And I'll give you a formula here in a second that I've always taught. And I call it the Duane formula, and there's a reason for it. But dopamine is given for hypotension. It's usually how it's given. It's given, we start it typically at 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. How in the world do you figure that out at 3 in the morning? And this is why most people don't like to give dopamine, is they don't want to do the math. It's actually very simple. Let's use street rule. All right, which works fine for the pre-hospital environment. If you take 400 milligrams of dopamine and you put it into a 250 cc bag of normal saline, you now have what's considered to be a 1600 microgram per cc concentration. So what this means is after I've put 400 into 50, if I take one cc out of that IV bag and put it under a microscope, I'm gonna see 1600 micrograms of that drug on that slide, or in that CC. That's all it means. <clears throat> so how do we give five mics per kilo per minute? Easy. Here's your street rule. Take out a pen and paper and get ready for this. And I'm also gonna then give you the exact way of doing it. Street rule for giving dopamine at a 1600 microgram concentration at five mics per kilo per minute for the street. You roll up, <clears throat> somebody's sick, they're desperately trying to die on you, you want to give them dopamine. Take 400 milligrams, put it in 250, shake it up, smack your bag, plug it in. Now, 
Look at your patient's weight in pounds. All right, let's say your patient weighs 220 pounds. Okay, take that number, drop the last number. Now you have 22. Now subtract two from that number. You have 20. That's your drops per minute. That's it. 20 drops per minute equals now five micrograms per cc. I'm sorry, five micrograms per kilo per minute. That's it. That's as scientific as it gets. So let's say your patient weighs 175 pounds. Drop the last number. 17. Subtract 2. 15. 15 drops a minute. That's your 5 mic per kilo per minute drip rate. That's it. That's as difficult as it gets. Is it perfect? No. But even if you figured this out to the exact drop and you hung that bag in the back of an ambulance, now you're bouncing down the street, your drug your drip rate is not going to be perfect unless you have a pump. If you have a pump, well, then don't worry about the formula. You just pump, you know, plug it into the machine. It'll do it for you. But if you don't have a pump pre hospitally that's the street method. It's that easy. It really is. So let's say you wanted to go from five mics to 10. Okay, double your drip rate. Again, it's not perfect, but it's close. Right? And you're giving them something. So let me give you the exact formula. And I'll give credit where credit is due. I call this the Dwayne formula. Uh, when I was teaching a, a program, <clears throat> a paramedic program years ago, I had a gentleman in my uh, class. He had his PhD in anatomy and physiology from an Ivy League school. Super, super smart guy. <clears throat> uh, he was in my class, not because he was looking for a job, but the team that he worked for needed a paramedic and he volunteered to go. Super nice guy. And if I remember right, his name was Dwayne. So I called this the Dwayne formula. I put this nauseatingly long formula on the board for a dopamine drip, and he's looking at it. He asks me a few questions, and he goes like this. He takes his pencil, and he starts writing down. He goes, okay, Mike, try this, and he gives me this formula. Now, this formula works for a 1600 mic concentration, and it will work for any dose. 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 micrograms per kilo per minute doesn't matter. It'll work for any dose dose, but it has to be at a 1600 mic concentration. So get your pen and paper out. Here's what I call the Duane formula, and this will give you the exact testable drip rate for any dopamine drip at 1600 mics. So the formula, 0 0.0375, right? 0 0.0375 times weight in kilograms times dose, dose being 2, 5, 10, 15, or 20, however you want to run it in. That will give you the exact drops per minute for that patient for that dose. So I'll say it again. It's the Duane formula. 0 0.0375 times your weight in kilograms times your dose. 2, 5, 10, 15, or 20. Works every time. Fantastic formula. So go ahead and take that one to the bank. Let's move on. Uh, last drug we're going to talk about real quick is Benadryl. Benadryl or diphenhydramine, uh, antihistamine. For those of you who don't know, we have two types of histamine receptors in our body. We have H1 receptor sites that are primarily in your lungs and your blood vessels, and H2 receptor sites uh, that are in your GI tract. So sometimes you'll take a, uh, an antihistamine drug by classification, it's an antihistamine, for ulcers, uh, for GI problems, um, whereas your Benadryl that we're going to give pre-hospitally is typically an H1 type of histamine blocker. So when we talked before about your cardiac event, your cardiac world, uh, giving somebody morphine, and that stimulates an H1 receptor release or stimulation, these are patients who are now becoming hypovolemic, strike that hypotensive because they're suffering from leaky capillary syndrome. Well, we give them Benadryl, which is the H1 uh, blocker, and now we're gonna give them some fluids as well. We'll bring their pressure back up because now they're no longer leaping, leaking out of those capillary beds. And an allergic reaction will suffer from, some people will suffer from uticaria or hives. It's leaky capillary syndrome. That's what's causing that discoloration at the cutaneous level of the skin. So if we give them Benadryl, well, it takes care of the hives, takes care of the itchiness doesn't do a whole lot for bronchoconstriction. It does a little bit, not enough, 
which is why we also give epi to somebody who is suffering from an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, because we want that big, heavy beta-2 stimulation to bronchodilate. So that's your Benadryl versus epinephrine in your anaphylactic world. All right, I think we've hit everything here on the pharmaceutical side of the house for pharmacology part two. We're right on time. We're at 45 minutes. I will do a more in-depth um, ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support video at a, a time here in the near future where we'll talk about ACLS. We'll talk about pacing, cardioversion, different drugs, amiodarone, lidocaine, so on and so on and so on in the cardiac world, just for our not only for our ALS providers, but for our ALS and our BLS providers. But uh, for our ALS providers, this is a, a feather in a cap class that most of us have to have. So we, uh, it's important that we do that review. Um, that's all for Pharmacology Part 2. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, next class, I think, is Patient Assessment. i got to check my notes. So let's come up with, a, let's come up with a, a code word here because I forgot to look at my list of code words. How about... Oh, uh, oh! Looking behind me, ships. All right, ship or ships. Let me write that down so I remember that one. All right. So for my FBI folk, your code word for this class is going to be ship. Um, had a great time doing it. Always enjoying it. I will see you again on Thursday. This is Tuesday's video, but I'll probably put it out uh, Monday. Uh, have a great day. Have a great. Uh, evening, whatever it is you're doing. Stay COVID free. Always enjoy it and have a great existence. See you. Bye.